2020 could be very easily described as the year that just didn't happen for some extremely obvious reasons that I think we're all sick of hearing about. 2021 hasn't been that much better for us so far, but I think that's just the state of the world right now, I think, I guess. Specifically, it's been really weird. The shift to working from home has meant there's just really not that much out there as far as new stuff goes, meaning that what's out there currently has been cooking for long enough that it could be released, or everything else has been pushed further and further back. Don't be wrong, there's been some really cool games released this year so far. Hitman 3 is fantastic, but it's more Hitman, which is either a really good thing or not, but for me personally, I think that's a really cool thing. I really like Returnal and what it's trying to do, but I kind of dropped off a little bit because it kind of didn't launch in the best state. I just would have been waiting for a patch or two or three. I really like Dwarf Romantic. It's chill as hell and really comfy, but it's also an early access and I kind of want to wait a little bit for that to come out. You know how it is. So in that case, thanks to the incredibly specific and scientific process that is Elimination, does that mean that the extremely well-written Adios is the best game of 2021 thus far? 2021 has been best spent diving into the backlog and playing all the stuff, and more interestingly, finding new and exciting ways to play all the games that I've been meaning to get around to. And somewhat coincidentally, most of what I've been playing lately has been adventure games. I guess right now that all I've been really wanting is good writing and good dialogue, and I can kind of tolerate some possible gameplay, I guess. So allow me to go through some games I've been playing and finding new ways to experience them, and hopefully this inspires you to go, go back into your backlogs, find new ways to play these games, and just have a grand old time. If you've been around the retro gaming scene lately, you would have heard of a thing called FPGA. Short for Field Programmable Gate Array, it's a type of circuit that consists of logic blocks, or gates, that can be configured to more or less be anything that a programmer desires. As far as what this has done for the retro gaming scene, it's technology that's seen excellent use in video upscalers to provide great images, but more so in devices allowing you to play games, which, when programmed well, have proven to be accurate, low latency ways of playing older games. So here's the best way I can explain this. With most emulation solutions, you're running a program that's attempting to be another computer, so there's a layer of two latency, so depending on how it's coded, the latency could be mostly negligible or a complete disaster. With FPGA, and assuming it's coded correctly, you're playing a game on a device that's more or less been configured to be the original hardware, so you don't really have all those extra layers of latency, it also means that the games can actually be a little more accurate as far as running them goes. One company really helping to popularize FPGA devices amongst retro gamers is Analog, who have made their name selling gorgeous FPGA devices that take original controllers and cartridges. Analog's devices are pretty cool and amazing, but they're also kind of pricey, and even before the pandemic, were almost never in stock. What's quickly becoming a great alternative to what Analog offer is Mister, an open source project that takes an existing FPGA device and builds it into a more comprehensive gaming and computing system, with developers contributing cores that represent things like, say, the Super Nintendo, Game Boy Advance, Apple II, CPS 1 and 2, and a slew of other 8 and 60 bit computers, consoles, portables, and arcade boards. Getting further into this is beyond the scope of what I want to do in this video, and it's something I really would like to revisit at some point, but all this is a lengthy and verbose way of saying that I used FPGA devices to play through one of the very few Hideo Kojima games I haven't really spent that much time with. That, of course, is Snatcher. Snatcher is an adventure game originally released in the late 80s where you play as Rick Deck, I mean Gillian Seed, an amnesiac who works for an organization called Junker, tasked with finding and stopping the threat of the Snatchers, robots who masquerade as humans. Now, if this is all sending a tad like Blade Runner, yeah, it totally is. Unabashedly so. The big difference is that the not replicants actually know that they're robots, and they totally look like legally distinct Terminators. You see, late 80s Japan was a wild, wild time. On Mister, there are three ways you can play the game. There's the original MSX version, which has been fan translated to English years ago. There's the Sega CD version, which is the only official way you can play it in English, and that's how I've been playing it. But there's also another MSX version called SD Snatcher, which takes the full complete game and turns it into an RPG. Snatcher is one of the rare PC adventure games that does a reasonably good job of translating Super Bowl to consoles because of its core design. Time, Japanese adventure games were heavily menu driven. So instead of navigating a character around a scene and using verbs or pointing and clicking or even using things like a text parser, you issue commands via menu, something that works super well across both a keyboard and a controller. So from a design point, but that's another topic for another time. Strangely though, this method of kind of control actually holds up better than what Kojima and his team attempted to do with the game's successor, Police Norts. That game shifted to a more conventional, master-driven point-and-click system, 
which led to more than a few instances of pixel hunting, which is never ever fun. And that's not getting into some of the other stuff that game has. Snatcher has the benefit of also playing super well on console and better optimized than some of the other adventure games on the Sega CD. As an example, that system received ports of the Secret of Monkey Island and the Adventures of Willy Beamish, both of which are at least two to three years younger than Snatcher's original release. While it's commendable and kind of wild to be able to play both these games and both do a good job of resembling their PC versions, they're also a few years too early. Willy Beamish in particular has a lot of issues with loading, and Monkey Island relies on passwords in lieu of saving your game. That's on top of the PC interface not really working all that well on a controller, something that's particularly an issue with Monkey Island thanks to keeping the scum bar intact. Fortunately, it's not a game that requires Twitch reflexes, it's still annoying though. Playing on a Mister doesn't alleviate all the issues with Snatcher, or even the aforementioned ports of Monkey Island or Willy Beamish, but being able to use any controller I'd like and having some good visual scaling options is kinda cool. The load latency definitely helps with the game's shooting segments, which can range from pretty easy to Jesus Christ, why do people think adventure games actually needed action sequences? Really though, it's nice to be able to play a Kojima game that isn't afraid to wear its inspirations on its sleeve, and from a time where Kojima could be made to cut stuff down and didn't desperately try to be gaming Scarf Marenghi. I know writers who use subtext and they're all cowards. It does not say it's welcome, it still looks and sounds incredible and, save for those shooting segments, pretty chill. The Earl of Nanny's dub, whenever it plays, hits just right, and I love it. Thanks for coming, Seed. I'm Benson Cunningham, the chief of Junker Operations. Gillian Seed, I've been transferred here from the 17th Special Forces Division. I've heard all about your special training in the military, Seed. I hope you'll put it to good use on your new assignment here. In a lot of ways, I kind of wish Kojima could just go back and do something simpler but those days are long behind us. Sadly, Mister is one of the better ways that you can actually play Snatcher these days. The game hasn't seen a re-release since its PlayStation and Saturn ports in the late 90s, which never left Japan. Not to mention the Sega CD version is still the only official way you can play the game in English, and is stupidly hard to come by in the second-hand markets. The closest thing we've gotten to Kojima doing anything Snatcher related lately is the radio drama Snatcher, which he wrote in collaboration with Goichi Suda, you might know him as Suda51, the iconic game designer. Still though, if you haven't played Snatcher, I urge you to find some way to experience it. It holds up pretty well, and still remains incredibly charming. Though speaking of games that are incredibly charming... There was a wonderful time between Return of the Jedi and The Phantom Menace, where the best thing George Lucas was known for was high quality, genre defining PC gaming, thanks to the LucasArts brand. And part of that was LucasArts taking on the most popular genre PC games at the time, point and click adventure games. And believe it or not, despite loving their work, I'd only ever finished two of them, the Sublime Samba Max Hit the Road, and the amazing and excellent Full Throttle. While I'd always been aware of Monkey Island, I never really got into the series proper. It wasn't until I was chatting with a mate of mine earlier in the year that I decided to give the games a proper go, with the hope of trying to at least finish the first three by year's end. So far, I finished both The Secret of Monkey Island and Monkey Island 2 LeChuck's Revenge, but through their respective special editions, which do well in making those games work in modern contexts. In a lot of ways, these are probably the best ways to play these games in 2021. We've got console ports and run and play pretty well, something helped by the fact that the Xbox 360 versions are backwards compatible with modern Xboxes. They do the cool thing some revised versions of games do, where it's running both a new version and the original version simultaneously, so you can just swap between the two with a simple button press. There's some visual tweaks and the interface is a little bit on console, there's also a really good hint system that feels helpful and I'll be honest, I'm not ashamed to have used it when trying to get used to the game's logic. But the big thing that's really helped me personally is the additional voice acting. Now, I'm someone who plays a lot of old games, and when you do that, you obviously have to factor in the time and place in which the game was made, as well as what was technically possible at the time of production. Both Monkey Island and its sequel were made during a time where adventure games either didn't have voice acting, or were including voice acting as more and more games are even being made or re-released for CD-ROMs. It's not that the writing of both Monkey Island games really needs voice acting to make them work, they're still delightfully silly and wonderful and I love it so, so much. This is just me and my stupid brain needing a voice in front of me to make it work. It's also kind of the reason why when, I come to, when it comes to gag manga, I can't really read it, I prefer kind of watching an anime adaptation of it. Maybe it's just the fact that there's a performance behind that works better for me. Don't ask me why, blame my really stupid brain. 
Voice acting is pretty good across both games. This also leads to a really interesting problem with the first game. If you want to play with voice acting, you have to play the game using the updated visuals and the new interface. While it's Final Console, it's less than ideal on PC. Don't get me wrong, it works, it's just not as snappy as I'd like, but the real issue is the look of the new models. Everything about them just doesn't look right, particularly Guybrush, whose eyes are just lifeless. It also doesn't help that all the models are more or less drawn onto the older sprites, which makes sense, but it also means that these new models, which don't look that great to begin with, also animate as stiffly as the original sprites do, which is fine when you're looking at them in the, in the original game, but not when it's newer and fancier, that just leads to a little bit of a disconnect. Fortunately, Monkey Island 2 lets you use the newly recorded voices in the classic version of the game, and it's by far the best way to experience it, allowing you to take advantage of its utterly gorgeous look and music implementation with the new voices. Speaking of which, that's one thing about Monkey Island 2 that really is cool, I need to talk about it, so excuse me for a minute, we're going to the nerd lore corner. <laughs> Monkey Island 2 was the debut of a LucasArts technology known as iMuse, short for Interactive Music Streaming Engine. The basic idea is that it dynamically switches between different bits of music without breaking the mood of the current area, and does so in a really subtle way. The best way to experience it is in the opening area of the game, which is often cited as the single biggest example of iMuse at work. And if you don't believe me, here's an example. Still, it's really neat tech, and coincidentally enough, the best way to get the most out of it these days is on a Mister with a Raspberry Pi that emulates a Roland MT32 MIDI module, which makes the already amazing soundtrack sound even better. Unlike Snatcher, both Monkey Island and Monkey Island 2 Special Editions are both easily available and fantastic examples of how you take old games and make them work in a more modern context, both for newer players but also returning players. So that's what I've been up to lately. And I'm curious as to what new ways you've discovered to play old games. So leave a comment. I'm actually super keen to read what you guys got. Until then, I'm going to go point and click some more because that's proven to be a fantastic means of playing games. It worked for LucasArts, it worked for Sierra, and it worked for Blizzard. And they're all doing great, right? Right?